Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Latin Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I have to tell you, before we get into uh, today's guest, which I've, I've been excited about this guest for, since I've, I've read the book, The Science of Selling, Proven Strategies to Make Your Pitch, Influence Decisions, Close a Deal. But I, I don't want to forget about my Six Sigma geeky, automation-based, Zapier-loving co-host, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist posting, hostingdomination.com forward slash landgeek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I am uh, fantastic and I am ready to put on my learning cap today and talk about a topic that I don't think enough of the land geekers really understand what's involved with this aspect of the business. So I'm excited to talk to our guest today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited as well because it's one of those things and we're going to get into it that, you know, you go to university, you go to business school, um, whatever it is, and it's arguably the most important function of business and yet the least sort of talked about, right? And it's selling. Um, our guest today is going to help you make money, right? Because if the or I mean, and if if you're not, you know, money motivated, that's fine. But the science of persuasion, whether it's you know selling a piece of raw land, or whether it's selling your teenager to be a responsible driver, or it's selling your spouse to you know. <laughs> don't overextend the credit card this month. Whatever it is in your life, David Hoffeld, the chief behavioral strategist at Hoffeld Group, a research-based sales training, coaching, and consulting firm is going to help you move the needle in your life, in your business, in everything because it all comes down to selling. David works with companies throughout North America, showing them how to align their sales message with the findings of behavioral science, very Dan Ariely-ish. I love Dan Ariely. He is a respected thought leader who's widely regarded as the number one authority on integrating behavioral science and sales. So it's not, it's not just like those hardcore used car salesmen and guys sales. This is geeky sales. This is behavioral science and sales. David has also been featured in little known magazines like, oh, I don't know, you probably have heard of Fortune or US News and World Report, CBS Radio, Fox News, Radio and more. He's also teaching at Harvard Business School on the class that everybody should be taking, but no one takes selling. David Hoffeld, how are you? Hey, great to be here, Mark and Scott. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be fun. No, no it, it really is. So, David, um, kind of tell us, like, how'd you get started in becoming, like, a sales trainer? You know, I have been in sales for many years as a salesperson, sales manager, director of sales, VP of sales, and I've always been a student of wanting to learn my craft, wanting to get better. And really, the way I got into the science of it was I stumbled on an academic journal about 12 years ago in social psychology, which is defined as the scientific study of how human beings are influenced in a social setting. And I, one of the articles in the journal I thought was so applicable to what I did every day as a sales professional, and so I applied it. And I got some decent results from just that one piece of information. And so I started sharing it with my team, and then I began to adopt the oddest hobby, probably of anyone that's ever been on your show, which is I became obsessed with reading academic journals in this area. And so I threw myself into it, and um, in 2009, I launched my firm, The Huffell Group, which is focused on research-backed sales strategies that literally show salespeople how to align how they sell with how our brains are wired to make buying decisions. And uh, here we are a couple of years later, we got a book that just came out and we're helping companies all around the world right now. So it's, it's exciting. I, I know I'm excited. I know Scott Todd's excited <laughs> because, you know, if you don't come from a sales background, this is really hard. There's a lot of stuff in your head, right, about selling. Um, David, kind of share with us sort of the, the sales stereotypes. 
Yeah, and you're exactly right. Oftentimes, we get intimidated by selling. If we're not in the profession, it can be difficult. You think either you have it or you don't. Many of us think that. You know, you're born a salesperson or you're born, uh, you just can't do it. It's not for you. And here's the reality. That's not true. I mean, science has decoded what makes a great salesperson now. We know the specific behaviors that when you utilize them, you're instantly more influential. And isn't that what all of us want? Regardless of what we do for a living, all of us want more influence. We want to hear yes more often. What is influence? I define it as it's what guides people in taking what you say seriously and being willing to act on it. And so that's what we're all about. And there's a science to it. We now know the specific behaviors that enable and generate influence. And when you leverage this, regardless of your profession, you instantly become more influential. And influence is the currency of success. Those who are influential are far more likely to become successful. And there's a science to it. So anyone can get better, regardless of your natural ability or your starting place or where you are today, anyone can be improved. So whether you're good or you're horrible at selling, it doesn't matter. You can always get better by applying this science. Let's talk about the science. Scott yeah. Todd, you ready to get geeky? Yeah. So I, I mean, I agree. I, I think that no matter what you're weak at, you do it enough times, you can get better at it. Um, and I, I really think that, I think that it's funny because you see people who have never sold in their lives and they try to start selling. And the first thing they do is they start to sound like a used car salesman, you know, like, what do I have to do to get you to do this today? And that's like the wrong thing to say, right? Like it's about relationships. So what is the science? Yeah, there's a well, lot. I'll, of I'll tell you right now, by the way, start, sorry to take your, your thunder, David, but it's, go ahead. Go ahead. Scott, to answer your question, it's BD equals F oh. parentheses, S <laughs> comma, E S. David oh. Hoffeld, what is a science-based selling methodology? Oh, you're speaking my language now. So that is an equation from the book. Do not let the word equation throw you because this is practical, easy to execute stuff. So what Mark was so uh, wonderfully sharing is that a buying decision, what is it? We've actually decoded it through now decades of research. And what it is we found is two things, which is what that equation that Mark was just sharing uh, illustrates. Number one, we have found that a buying decision is made up of certain incremental commitments that guide our potential customers on a progression of consent and naturally advance the sale. This is a huge breakthrough. In fact, I say it's one of the biggest breakthroughs in the last 100 years in selling because it tells us what a sales process should be doing. We should guide people in making certain, there's six of them, six commitments that if they don't make, they'll never buy. Meaning these six commitments will show you how should you sell. Instead of trying to guess your way to success, man, that's expensive, right? You want to guess your way? Oftentimes you try stuff out in the world of selling. By the time you figure it out, whoops, you're out of a job, right? Why do that? The science shows us exactly what we should do. So there's certain commitments. You get them, you're going to be very successful because that's how our brains make a buying decision. The second thing, though, that you were sharing, Mark, the, word, the, the two letters, ES, as emotional state. Oh, boy, this is powerful because emotions matter, right? We all know that in selling. Emotions matter. Everyone said that for decades. How do they matter and how do you know? Some breakthrough research in neuroscience that we talk about in the book shows us exactly what emotions do and equally important, how should we leverage them in the sale? Powerful stuff. When you learn this, you're instantly more successful as soon as you put that book down. Not that you want to do that, but whenever you have to, instantly more successful. You want to, let's get granular, David. All right. All right. I got 40 acres in Nevada. Road access, mountain views. It's 30 miles from the nearest town. Sell it to me. Sell it to me. You want me to sell it to you? I'm All right. Sell it to me. Let's apply some of the things we just talked about here. So we'll, the first thing we want to do is anytime we talk to anyone, one of our, the biggest commitment we want to get, one of the biggest six and often the hardest one to get is why change? So why should someone even consider a property like that or anything else, regardless of what you're selling? This is our biggest competitor. And this is where most sales are lost. We lose as professionals. If you're a salesperson or a business owner, you've lost more business to nothing than to someone, right? We lose, people don't always choose a competitor or choose another piece of property in your analogy. They say, well, I'm just gonna stay where I am. 
I'm not doing anything. So how do you break through that? We got to break through and get them to commit to why change. Because until I get that, me showing a property, you're trying to sell you something you don't want, it's irrelevant. So I got to generate, why should you even consider this? I got to break through what researchers call status quo bias, which means the tendency for us to assign a high level of risk to doing something as opposed to nothing. How do I do that? There's a number of ways. One of the easiest and most influential is I got to disrupt your uh, status quo bias with insights. What kind of insight can I leverage that I know would matter to you, right, around that piece of property? That's going to at least incite some interest. You're like, okay, I like that. I want to know a little more. And then I can get into it because I, I got to break through that firewall, right? I got to break through that of that status quo bias. I have to say, I have to open you up to change. And this is the biggest problem in selling. We're not doing this effectively. And it's going to cost us a lot of money. Or in your case, if you don't do this, you're not going to sell that property, my friend. Okay, so how do I find that out? How do you find out the insight? So let's apply to the person you're talking to. So uh, we'll do a little sales coaching. So if why would someone want to consider that property? What is it about the property that would be appealing? It's... It's rural. I, there's no restrictions. I've got clean air. I can use it recreationally. I can camp on it. I can, I can hunt on it. I can, you know, fishing's nearby. Um, it's, a, it's a trophy for me. I mean, 40 acres, man. Like, it's, it's a lot of property. A lot of land. I, I own 40 acres. It's a long-term investment. My banker's going to love me because my net worth just went up substantially on paper because okay. now I, I own this asset. Excellent. Okay, so you've got a lot of value propositions, right? But rather than just pitch them out, right, I want to try to connect the dots for my buyer. And this is something else we talk about in the book. So I want to try to understand what is it that motivating every buyer is going to be a little different. So some of those things you mentioned are going to be irrelevant. I get to care less about my banker. I got clean air everywhere I go. I got that at home right now. So some of those are, other things might be, man, having 40 acres, in the middle of nowhere, that sounds awesome to me. <laughs> so I want to know what matters, right? So I got to understand my potential customer enough. We talk about this in the book. We call them primary buying motivators. So I got to know certain things about my customer. So in sales, we always talk about listening a lot, listening to our customer understanding. We say that's fine, but more important than listening is what am I listening for? Once I know certain pieces of information, then I connect the dots, right? So if I was trying to, if I knew that having a lot of land was important to you, Mark, right? And I'm trying to sell this property, rather than throwing out all kinds of things that you probably don't care about, I'm going to focus on that. So Mark, a few minutes ago, you mentioned how you want to have a lot of acres. You want to be out in the country, have a lot of acres. With this property, I want to show you 40 acres, pristine. You're going to be all yours. You're going to have that peace and quiet that you said you want. So I'm going to connect the dots, make it easy for your brain to see value. Because this is an important point. Value is always created in the buyer's minds, not in ours. And sometimes too often in sales, we kind of try to push value on people. We say, here's what I would like about this piece of property. And I, I assume you're the same way as me. And that's not the case. So rather than just throw out value propositions, we want to say, okay, because most of them they're not going to care about. So I want to find out what do you care about? Because if I start talking about things you don't care about, I'm irrelevant. And I don't ever want to do that because then people shut you out. Boom, I'm done. I'm injecting from the conversation mentally. So I got to find out what matters to you. And then I want to connect the dots. We call it a primary buying motivator statement. We actually trademark that term. Yep. All right. Fantastic. So, no. So it's, really, it's, it's really, it's really about in the beginning of that relationship or in, in the beginning there, it's, it's really about a lot of que asking questions, looking, hunting. It's not really about selling at that point. It's the why, trying to understand their why, and then trying to figure out what, what is it, a, what characteristic of this property do I, do I have that I can connect to something that David is of interest, that's of interest to David. Exactly. Yeah. It's very hard to persuade people that you don't understand. And, and when we try to do that, what we do is we just throw out ideas at them. And here's what I always say. We call it feature dumps and selling. I'm sure you guys have heard the term. Yeah. Um, and the problem with it is if I throw out 10 value propositions, you might care about number seven. But by the time I got to number four, you stopped listening. Right. And you're like, well, you know, I gave you 10 value propositions. One of them you cared about, but nine of them you didn't. So I just gave you nine reasons why. You shouldn't buy my product or service. So you're exactly right. But what a lot of companies face 
and I guess it, I didn't bring it out in the analogy I was given here about the property, but a lot of people face is how do I get an audience with someone? All right, that's always a big issue for a lot of companies. How do I break through the noise in the marketplace and get you to give me a few minutes so I can ask you some questions? What we say in that and we talk about in the book is we wanna leverage something called reciprocity. Reciprocity is a scientific principle. It's been studied for about 80 years um, in depth. And what it says is that people should repay others for what they have been given. Right? So if you give me something, I feel indebted to you and I'm more likely to respond to your request. So what do we do? If I want to, let's say I'm cold calling somebody, right? I'm trying to call them up and I know I can help them, but I got to break through. So, if, or I'm trying to meet them at an event. What do I do? I want to interrupt with value, right? I'm going to give them value right away. Because if I go in and say, hey, uh, Mark Scott, um, we have an amazing product that I'd love to share with you. If I can have a few minutes of your time to ask you some questions, we can find out if we can be of service to you. You're going to say no. You're going to be like, I'm busy, man. I don't got time to go fishing for value with you, right? Instead, I got to interrupt you and I got to know what is it you care about. So let's say I do some research and I know your company's hiring some people. So I would interrupt you and say, um, you know, we just put together a white paper with five science-based strategies that are proven to reduce the likelihood of a mishire. And I wanna give that to you because rather than me telling you how we can help you with your hiring choices, I'd rather just show you so you can see for yourself. Mark, where would you like me to send that white paper to? Boom, and now once you accept it, you're far more likely now to answer my questions. Why? Because you owe me, you just accepted something. That's a real value to you. And if I'm selling, let's say a hiring process or a, or a testing for hiring, I just demonstrated that value as well. And hopefully you'll read it, you'll enjoy it, you'll pass it on to colleagues. So it's an advertising tool with me, but it's a way I break through that status quo bias. I got a, it's a way for me to knock on the door and I do it with value. I, I love it. Scott, if I told you that David Huffeld is going to be training um, you one-on-one -on -one and is going to improve your sales conversion ratio by three times by the end of the year, would you be interested in spending an hour with him? Yes. That is an incremental commitment. What is the power of incremental commitment, David? Mm. It is the sale, the research shows this pretty conclusively, decades of research, that the easiest way to get someone to make a big decision is to first get them to make a small decision that's consistent with it. This is the key to selling. What great salespeople do is they get commitments. Commitments are the building blocks of the sale. Reality is there are certain commitments that if people don't make that are relatively small, if they won't make them, they'll never commit to buying your product or service. So what is the goal of every sales process? To make certain incremental commitments that guide our potential customers on a progression of a consent, naturally advancing the sale. The reality is this is the way our brains make buying decisions. We don't just make one big commitment at the end of a sale. When I'm listening to a sales call, I'm saying yes to some things, no to some things. I'm making commitments in my hand left and right. Now, how much more effective would it be if salespeople guide potential customers in making these commitments, make it easy for them? Because if they don't, they can't say yes at the end. And so we want to align our sales processes with these commitments. So incremental commitments are literally the building blocks of the sale. Scott, when I asked you that question, how'd you feel? Uh, a little cautious, but you know, it, it led me to a yes. And then I felt a little relieved, like what do I have to lose? David, how'd you feel when I asked him that question? You could have set it up a little better. Let me, let me show you what you can do here. Uh, Cause you raise a good point. Commitments matter, but they're often, sometimes there's still a little bit of rub there, right? You still got, again, it's less than at the end of the sale when you ask for one at the close, but it, it's still a little bit rough. So what do you do? Research on this too. You want to prepare people for commitments. What comes directly before a commitment matters? So what we say is before I ask, we call it in the book and in commitment trial close, I want to ask an involvement trial close. What does that look like? I want to get Scott to affirm the value that the commitment is based on. Help him think through it. So let's say I just presented to go with what you just described, Mark. Let's say I just presented my products or services and Scott right now is, he's in awe. I can see it in his eyes. He's, he's loving every second of it. And so I would say, Scott, does it make sense why so many people, when they learn about the Huffel Group and our science-backed approach, choose to do business with us? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. 
Scott, would you want to spend one hour with me just exploring how we can help you and improve your business by over 300%? Mm, yeah, I, maybe, you know, sure. Okay, okay that's yeah, good. Take my credit card. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk, we'll, we'll talk about, he said maybe. He didn't give me a commitment, which I'm not going to let go. I'm going to come back to that in a second, Scott, so you're not off the hook. But you see what I did there? I'm preparing him for it. Now, for Scott not to give me a commitment, he has to go against what he just said makes sense that so many people are doing, okay? Yeah. But Scott is like a lot of people, and he, he wasn't ready yet, right? I mean, I'm, I haven't presented all this to him, and this doesn't happen to me in real life, obviously, but uh, in this case, it didn't, right? So he, he said, oh, I'm not sure yet. So what do I want to do? Scott's not saying no to me. Uh, he's saying, well, I'm not ready yet. He's, he's still not there mentally. He's still processing it. So what do I want to do? I want to help him think through it. I want to help Scott defend where he's at, but in my favor. So I would say this. So Scott, it sounds like you're definitely considering spending some time with me and kind of looking at how you're selling currently. If we were to spend some time together, what do you think some of the advantages would be in that? Well, I think I would, I think I would learn something new. I think, uh, I'm not sure I would get three times my, uh, my, you know, annual sales increase in an hour. That seems a little far-fetched, but I think I could learn something new. Okay. And that being the case then, um, would you like to spend an hour together just to see if we can learn something new and see how much we can help you in sales? Maybe you're right. Maybe it won't be three times, but even if it was, if we got you by 5% increase, wouldn't that be worth an hour of your time? Okay. All right. And Mark Arver sold it three times the, uh, in one hour, but. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, I made that situation very awkward because I fast forwarded through so many pieces of yeah. Actual sales process to get to yeah. my point of incremental commitment just to illustrate it. But I think the way that you did it was much smoother and less, you know, I think what I was trying to get out of you, both of you is the way I said it was manipulative yeah. versus the way you said it, which is more of a guiding, helping, let's connect the dots and let's make these trial commitments, these small little trial commitments to guide Scott towards what would we could all agree is going to benefit him, right? It's not, it's not going to benefit David necessarily. It's not for him. It's for Scott. It's David helping Scott make a good decision for Scott. And clearly, if you didn't think it was a good decision for Scott, you wouldn't do it, right? Exactly. And that's a very important point as well. Yeah. And that is everything we do, everything we're talking about here is always focused on the buyer. It's extremely buyer centric. So a science back way of selling is the most buyer centric approach there is because everything is about the buyer. It's how does the buyer's brain work? How, what is matters to the buyer? What's their perspective? What's their belief system? So I'm so focused on my buyer and everything I do is for them and it's all about them. So it's, it, and it's great because it removes a lot of my biases and my opinions and, and things that can get in the way of the sale out of, out of, the, uh, out of the arena and I can really focus on my buyer. Uh, in this case, Scott. So yeah, the commitments like I demonstrated there would come after I've presented you know, about it. So in me, a little, we went a little bit about order, but you can see how we, we want to guide people and make commitments. So we'd say, how can we help people? And there's a whole science to that called choice architecture, which is really cool, which is a little bit of what I just demonstrated there, kind of cold on, on Scott, but it's, it's very non-confrontational and it guides people in making some pretty big choices very easily and confidently. So I think a lot of people have a hard time, David, and let me know if you think I'm wrong from a science-based perspective, I'm just saying this anecdotally, um, asking for the sale, mm. right? So yes. they can go through the questioning, right? They can get the trial commitments, but then when it comes to ask for the actual sale, they tense up, the buyer feels it, right? And they react to that. Yeah. Is, this a, is this a real thing or is this me? It's a real thing. In fact, there's science to validate what you just said. We talk about it in the latter part of the book that people vastly uh, underestimate compliance rates. They've done studies on this where when they say, you know, when you make a certain request, this request of a person, you ask 100 people, what do you think, what do you think the percentage are that are going to say yes to you? People vastly underestimate it by multiple times, hundreds of percents. Uh, so we vastly underestimate. We think, you know, a lot of that fear is on us. But when you adopt two things, when you adopt this science back way of selling with these incremental commitments, it makes the close easier. But why? Because they've already made certain commitments. So they've, they've gone on this progression of consent that's advanced the sale and they're ready 
to say yes to you at the end of it. They're prepared. And if they're not, you know it. So the close isn't this roller coaster ride that it historically has been where we ask for these big commitments and we don't know what's going to happen and then they say objections. It doesn't have to be that way. When you align how you sell with how people buy, it's usually not. The close is very drama free. Why? Because I did all the heavy lifting earlier. I didn't wait till the end when I don't have the time. I do it throughout the sale. So if there's issues, I can correct them. So number one, if you adopt that, the close is easy. Number two, understanding that the fear is misplaced. That's our biases, it's not reality. So people are far more likely to comply with requests, even crazy requests, than we, than we believe. So it's, we don't have to be afraid of closing. Um, if you sell correctly, the close is relatively straightforward and can be very, very simple. What, what about, um, you know, like what, what about following up? Okay, like that's another area I think that people struggle with is you know, like, uh, uh, may, maybe my maybe I haven't executed on the the formula correctly. I, I haven't done this, and the, and I I miss the opportunity for the sale. Someone says, "Oh, I gotta here. Just send me the information. I'll look over it. I'll get back to you." You know what what I find is that people struggle with knowing how soon to follow up because they don't want to appear too pushy. But in today's market, and you start off the podcast by saying they're not choosing someone else; they're choosing nothing right? Like they're, they're not choosing. So if I let them go for a week, two weeks, a month, they're not going to choose me. They're not going to choose anything because that desire that they had at that moment's moved on. So when should I follow up? Yeah, it depends on the context. There's no hard and fast answer, like follow up within, you know, obviously you want to do it as soon as possible. It depends what's going on. So what I'd recommend is this at the end of the sales call, if you have multiple steps in your sales call, which most people do, right? You're not selling all at once. So if you're doing a one call close, that's different. But if you're doing multiple steps, so you have a longer sales cycle, at the end of the sales call, you wanna set up what happens next. So if they need to talk to someone else in their company, when will you be doing that? So I gotta to talk to my VP of sales before, you know, about what we've talked about. Okay, when would you be doing that? I'll do that on Monday. Okay. Great, so let's touch base again on Tuesday, uh, Scott, what does your afternoon look like on Tuesday for a call? Uh, I'm available after three. Um, I could do a 3.30, does that work for you? Absolutely. Okay, great, well I will give you a call at 3.30. Any reason why 3.30 wouldn't work on Tuesday, Scott? Okay. And if something does come up, Scott, would you give me a call and we can reschedule or send me an email? Sure, that's how I'm setting up follow-up calls, right? right? So I'm structuring them, I'm scheduling them. Because yeah, if you leave it to chance and try to get a hold of people, people are busy, it's hard to get a hold of people on the phone or even via email, people get, hundreds of emails a day. So you, you gotta set it up. So you wanna do it as soon as possible, uh, but I wanna structure it so that I have a, more of a likelihood of getting a hold of them and then talk about what's gonna happen next. I gotta continue that sale, that momentum. You're exactly right. So what, what happens, you know, like today, today there's a lot of communication that's not happening on the phone or face to face. It's happening, uh, it's happening electronically. It's happening in an email. It's happening across other platforms. How do I make that decision on, or how do I get that commitment of where I'm going to follow up next? Or how do I get them to move from email to a phone? I mean, because that's where things happen is on the phone. Yeah. So it depends, again, on the context of this. But what I want to do is I got to give enough value to earn a right to talk to you, right? So how do I do that? A um, number of different ways. One of the ways we talk about in the book that's really powerful, and this is a huge deal when you want to create a competitive advantage. So you're going against all of us. There's a lot of competitors in the marketplace. How do you differentiate? Because that's where we're all living, right? How do I differentiate? How do I build value? We say you want to look for what's called distinct value. What is distinct value? It's two things. Number one, it's something that my potential customer cares about. They have to care about it or it doesn't matter. Second, it's some way that I'm different than my direct competitors, right? If I'm different, but you don't care, I don't care, right? If, if, if you care about it, but I'm not different, it doesn't apply. It has to be both those things. I'm different, you care about it. I gotta leverage that, right? I gotta earn, I gotta give value to you, Scott, if I'm selling you at every stage of the sales call, because to your point, as soon as I stop giving value, you're gonna drop off. It used to be people expected value when they bought your product or service, not anymore. They want value at every stage. As soon as I stop giving you value, you're disconnecting, right? You're going to go with someone else or you're just going to push the whole decision off, forget about it, enjoy the holidays and move on with your life. And so I'm relentless about value. 
I want every time you and I interact that you're getting more uh, than you're giving up, right? I want, I want you to feel like, man, every time I talk to that guy, I get something. I'm going to come with an insight. I want to come with an article. Hey, Scott, um, I, I read an article yesterday on Forbes. I think you might like. I'm going to send it to you. And, you know, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm going to be relentless. I'm giving value constantly because then you're going to reciprocate with time. As soon as you stop giving value, you're going to have a hard time getting a hold of people. They're just not going to, they don't care because they don't see enough value in you to get on the phone. They're like, I don't care. You got to break through that. You got that apathy that our buyers have. You got to break through that with value. Yeah, I love it. And, and something that, you know, we're kind of getting into the podcast here, but, um, you know, one of the great things in the book that's really apl applicable to our sales cycle, uh, David, is anchoring, right? Mm -hmm. I have a 40 acre parcel, right? And values are all over the place. Yes. To anchor that price is so, so uh, powerful. And so can you kind of explain to everybody what anchoring means and how, yeah. how to apply it? Anchoring, you're exactly right. Anchoring, we call it, sometimes in sales, we'll call it price conditioning, but there's all kind of research on anchoring. What is anchoring? Our brains are comparison machines. So if I'm thinking about a piece of property, I'm comparing it to other pieces of properties. What someone told me something like this would cost. That's how I determine if your price is too high or too low, or this property is, do I like it or not? Is it a good value? I'm comparing it. So you have, we have two options. The brain is doing this automatically. We can just hope that it falls in our favor or we can create the anchor. What is an anchor? It's the starting point of the comparison. So what I would do is if I'm selling a piece of property, 40 acres, I don't know what the price is. Let's just say a million dollars, right? Keep it simple for me. And let's say that's the price of the property. I'm going to anchor a higher price than that before I disclose the price, before we get into talking about price. So I'm going to say, you know, a lot of properties around this area, similar to this in the last few years, have actually gone for, well, almost $2 million. Or I can even do an irrelevant anchor. I could say, you know, I have a friend in um, Washington State who looked at a property just like this. Now, this is out in Washington State, of course, but he paid over $3 million for it. So I know the prices are a little less here, which is good in your favor. You can get a lot of land here for a lot less than you can on the places. Right? Now, you might say, what does that do? I just put $3 million in their mind, right? And then the research shows anchors are covert ways of influence. People vastly underestimate the impact that they have. I mean, I'll give you an example. We had worked with one nonprofit a while ago. We were able to double their giving rates from their website. Here's how we did it. When they won the website, if you asked for a donation, you'd have a drop down and it would have five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so on dollars. We said, why are you doing that? Because what are you anchoring? Five, 10, 15, 20, 20, these are low numbers. No one wants a $5, we don't want a $5 donation. Let's change it up. So we threw that out, went to 25, 50, 100, 200, 500, donations skyrocketed. Why? Because we anchored higher numbers, right? If you see five, 10, 15, 20, you're gonna go, oh, I'll give, I'll give 20 bucks. When you see 25, 50, 100, you'll go, oh, I'll give 50 bucks, right? We just, we just doubled sales just like that. So that's an example of an anchor. You always want to create these in your sales process. So before you show price, or even if they know price beforehand, always anchor numbers. So they compare your price to something else that's favorable for you. I love it. I love it. Well, David, we're at that point in the podcast now where I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable. You've given so many tips, so much value on this podcast, but I'm going to ask you for one more piece. All right. I am going to recommend our uh, Twitter feed uh, at David Huffeld. You can follow me. We post all kind of stuff. I mean, all throughout the day, every single day, a lot of science-based ideas from myself as well as many other thought leaders too. We have 102,000 followers on Twitter. So I'd love to connect with you there. I know you're going to find a lot of value in what we offer. So that's at David Huffeld and I will see you on Twitter. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Wow. 102 followers, 102,000 followers. Make that 102,001. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, uh, Mark. So, you know, people, people uh, within our community, they, they will use Google Voice for different parts of their business, you know, to, to have a second phone number. 
I've been playing with this new new app. It's called Listen. It's at uselisten.com, uselisten.com. And it's really, really cool because uh, think of like a Google Voice, but, but not cloud-based, it's phone-based. And um, what's cool is I can set up like whitelist. So Mark, you know, I like you, David, I like you. I could give you my phone number and you get whitelisted right to my regular phone. Whereas maybe if you're not whitelisted, then you don't, you don't even get through. It just goes right to voicemail. Um, when I get messages, I can set up auto replies. So for text and stuff, you can auto reply. I mean, think about letting, letting your phone and an app for Pete's sake, work for you as opposed to you having to sit there and compose a reply. You can use kind of keywords and just keep the conversation going and you're not even doing it. I love it. I've downloaded it. I have not played with it yet, but it is yeah. on my phone. I like it. And uh, I'm done. I'm going to delve deeper into it. And my tip of the week is going to be learn more about David Huffeld at huffeldgroup.com huffeldgroup.com and pick up on is it i can can i get this on amazon david uh the science of selling absolutely amazon barnes and noble anywhere fine books are sold you'll see uh copies of the science of selling just waiting to be bought well i want to thank you uh for taking valuable your valuable time out to really educate us because at the end of the day the importance of selling cannot be overstated i remember you know hearing this uh this podcast with the founder of, of sam adams and he said, you know, he, he was like a Harvard grad yeah. and, you know, the guy's like, look, you got to go out door to door and sell. He's like, he thought it was beneath him. Right. And he had a really, really hard time with it. But then he realized like, this is what fuels my business. Yeah. You know, um, you could have the greatest strategy in the world, but if you're not getting any sales, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. So David, I want to thank you. Um, Scott, thank you. And uh, I want to thank the listeners, please. The only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a David Hoffeld from the Hoffeld Group to come on the podcast is if you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And if you do so, we're going to give you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. See how I anchored that, David? It's $97. Excellent. That's right. Don't call it free. Always assign a monetary value. You read the book. I know. Yeah. There yeah. You. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm applying. <laughs> We're playing. So uh, I want to thank everybody and let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Thanks, David. Thank you.